the west coast of Vancouver Island has a well-earned reputation for tumultuous seas, violent weather and fog. Towns, settlements and roads are few and far between. Beyond the far horizon, Japan is the next significant piece of land. Battered by the restless expanse of the Pacific Ocean, the coastline is fragmented into a series of sounds. Larger vessels must make the journey around the top and bottom of Vancouver Island, but once on the west coast, they are only exposed to the open ocean for 20 to 30 miles between each of the sounds. Our vessel is Venture, now in her 10th season with more than 48,000 miles under her keel. Most boats head south down the west coast, but we chose the opposite direction and have a bumpy ride up the Straits of Juan de Fuca. We spend the night in Port Renfrew and continue on to West Bamfield, where we moor at Mills Landing. Chris launches the tender to cross over to East Bamfield, which is connected by road to the rest of the island. West Bamfield is more rural. Our evacuation route takes us past waterfront cottages and the Coast Guard station. The long fjord connects Barclay Sound to Port Alberni, which is almost on the east coast. Despite its name, the Port Alberni Yacht Club has its only premises on Fleming Island, to which we now head. Here we receive a great welcome and are made to feel very much at home. The surrounding waters are a mix of skerries, rocks and islands and are best explored by tender. There are numerous caves. Colorful sea stars cling to the rocks at low tide. The plumage of this ruddy turnstone blends with its surroundings. After raising the large tender, we move on to Wuwa Island, where the guidebook describes an easy path to an exposed beach. Hmm, another case where the situation on the ground falls well short of the description in the book. Chris brings the small tender to collect us from a beach, densely packed with logs. There's a sandy beach somewhere under here. Logs are a common hazard in these waters. This one will take off on the next high tide to lie in wait for the unwary. Christine slips while boarding the tender, proving that the self-inflating jackets do indeed self-inflate.
Venture carries two tenders, a larger Zodiac for longer trips, and a small one with a flat bottom for going ashore. We cross the mouth of Barclay Sound to the town of Euclulet, home to many commercial fish boats. Euclulet is connected by surfaced road to the rest of the island. We awake to a misty morning. Quite by chance, we arrive on the occasion of the Yuki Days Parade. Hmm. I wonder about the old limey sign. A highlight is the loggers competition. This is a scary competition. Watch the guy on the foreground. This is a handicap event, and he started last. 40 seconds after the guy at the far end. We walk along the coast trail and watch a black bear foraging for berries. This turned out to be the only good bear sighting of the entire trip. Concealed in the undergrowth are tiny carnivorous sundew plants, each glistening drop a sticky nectar trap for unwary insects. Gnarled and deformed trees are evidence of the severe weather for which this coast is famous. This photo of a photo in a shop window shows the Tofino lifeboat leaving harbour during a winter storm. For ourselves, we have a smooth ride on the short passage to Clayquot Sound. This fog bow is a reminder of what we can expect. We are spared all but glimpses of fog until much later in the trip but its ghostly presence is our constant companion. Having visited Tofino by road from Euclulet, we moved directly inland up Clayquot Sound. Many interesting bays have narrow entrances, like this one at Water Creek, which must be navigated with care and at the right state of the tide. The sterling weather exceeds all our expectations. We make our first of several river excursions in the small tender.
The water is shallow and crystal clear. In places we need to use paddles. Strangely, the water is brown at the mouth of the river. There are many jellyfish. Concerned about one being sucked into the generator intake, we restrict its use. Chris examines this clump of flowers, apparently sprouting from solid rock. Nutka, the next major sound, is of great historical significance. We go first to Resolution Cove, where Captain Cook anchored his ship, Discovery in 1778. A plaque on the rocks marks this event, but there remains no other evidence of his visit. We cross the Sound to Friendly Cove and anchor below the lighthouse, built in 1911, which we later visit to learn that powered by a 35 watt bulb, its light can be seen for 16 miles. Just 230 years ago, Friendly Cove was a scene of bitter rivalry between the British, Spanish, Americans and the local people. It was the centre of a bustling trade in otter pelts, which ultimately led to the total elimination of sea otters along the entire coast, as well as the demise of the local inhabitants, who had been living here during the summer months for 4,000 years. We pay $12 each to the lady near the church. There are many local kids attending a summer camp. Only one was brave enough to accompany us inside. All the others said the church was full of ghosts. The present church was built in 1956 after a fire destroyed the original, built in 1911. Stained glass windows commemorate the trading agreement reached between the Spanish, British and the local chief Makina in 1792. Outside, a totem looks out to sea, welcoming visitors from all around the world. Except for being scalped and scarred by logging, the surrounding mountains appear the same as when Cook anchored here, in the same bay where Venture now swings to her anchor. From here we head up Tarsus Inlet to the town of Tarsus. Here we are directed into a tight spot in Westview Marina. Among its amenities, the marina offers a small restaurant with live music.
We reverse our course down the inlet into Tarsis Narrows. Boats are few and far between. We pass the Christian Fellowship Retreat of Esperanza. Fish farms are a common sight. Our next stop is Zabalos where it was difficult to find a place to moor in the shallow water. It too is connected by road, but did not really live up to its billing. The streets are quiet. All is calm and still when we leave the following morning. Back at the entrance to Cucot Sound, we tour the kelp beds in the tender. Sea otters increase the abundance of kelp because they feed on sea urchins which consume it. Sea otters are slowly repopulating the coast. Between 1969 and 1972, 89 animals were flown from Alaska and released in Chiclesset Bay, just north of here. A remote and peaceful anchorage at the end of a busy day is one of the pleasures of cruising. Mist hangs over the small settlement of Walker Cove. From here we head to the Bunsby Islands where careful navigation is required among the maze of rocks. We go ashore and walk along a beach in Battle Bay. As usual, there are many logs. We make a very short excursion up an unnamed river. Once again, the water is crystal clear. Brooks Peninsula is a major landmark on the west coast of Vancouver Island and rounding it is always a cause for celebration. We are blessed with fine weather allowing us to circumnavigate Salander Island just off Cape Cook to look for puffins and stellar sea lions. The surface of the sea is covered with countless small jellies with floating sails. After rounding brooks, we enter Lashkish Inlet through a narrow entrance. The lower branches of trees are submerged long enough at high tide to grow barnacles. We proceed deep into Quatsino Sound and through Quatsino Narrows to the small town of Cole Harbour and thence to the Marble River, where careful planning is essential because at low tide 
The entrance is barred by sandbanks. The way ahead lies concealed behind a dense canopy of trees which open up to scenes reminiscent of Jurassic Park. Here, a cave, large enough to enter in the tender. Kayaks are the perfect way to explore the river. Even at high tide, Shallow spots are a challenge. The way ahead is barred by rapids, and with the turn of the tide, it is time to reverse our course to avoid being stranded for hours on the mudflats guarding the entrance to the river. With the sun at our back, one side of the river is cast in deep shadow.
we stop in Winter Harbour at the mouth of Quatsino Sound. Sea otters hunt close to the boat. A fog bank lurks offshore as we head for Sea Otter Cove off St. Joseph's Bay. Several other boats are anchored here, including one group which has spent three weeks clearing garbage from remote beaches. From here we head for Cape Scott at the extreme northwest tip of Vancouver Island. It is here that fog finally wraps us in its embrace. We never see Cape Scott, just this glimpse of one of the offshore islands. We turn east, cross the infamous Nawiti Bar and head for Bull Harbour on Hope Island, enveloped in fog until after we enter the anchorage. The following morning it lies in wait for us at the entrance to the anchorage. We use radar to guide our way. Canadian Coast Guard ship appears ghostly in the mist. From Port McNeil, we divert from our circumnavigation of the island. Before continuing south, we take a diversion across the Queen Charlotte Strait to the Broughton Islands on the mainland to renew our acquaintance with the Roaring Hole Rapids. Nepa Lagoon is four miles long, half a mile wide and 500 feet deep. Every six hours at the turn of the tide, the water streams in or out of this large body of water through a narrow channel only 40 yards wide. The channel is flat calm at slack water, but a raging maelstrom at other times, so timing is critical. The chart reads, high water slack occurs two hours after high water at Alert Bay. Low water slack occurs three hours and 30 minutes before higher high water and two hours 55 minutes before lower high water. This tidal diagram illustrates higher high water and lower high water. Here the water is streaming in through the narrow channel maybe an hour after slack, when it is still safe to take a tender with a powerful motor into the rapids. We return later 
to watch water pouring out of the lagoon at full flow, taking care to stay well beyond the main stream. We spend the night in a nearby anchorage. Using the depth finder in the tender to check the depths at low and high water slack, we judge it safe to take venture into the lagoon at high water slack, when, just for a few minutes, the water will be flat calm. It is hard to believe that within two hours this will once again become a raging torrent. Once inside we will have to remain for 12 hours before the next high water slack and as the only possible anchorage in the lagoon offers poor holding this means a daytime visit to avoid the need for a nighttime anchor watch. We find ourselves in a lost world as we cruise the length of the lagoon. Guarded by the rapids, few people visit this spot. But loggers have been here, leaving in their wake evidence of their presence. Here, an ancient donkey engine. And there, an abandoned bathtub. Behind a narrow screen of trees, debris from clear-cut logging, like a gigantic game of pickup sticks, bars our progress. Strange mosses hang from the trees.
A fallen tree provides a self-contained ecosystem for a multitude of plants and tiny creatures. Lichen, with the lovely name of Methuselah's beard, festoons the trees. A multi-armed sea star lurks beneath the clear water. Time and tide wait for no man, and it is time for us to leave. Disturbed water creates a layer of gauzy mist. Its presence and the uneasy movement of the currents are evidence that the tide has turned. Within a few minutes, Roaring Hole Rapids will once again be true to their name as they dance to the tune of the ceaseless tides. <laughs>